May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. I am a true child of the Reformation. I grew up on it. Rather than trunk or treat or Halloween parties, my little church had Reformation Day parties where we dressed up as major Reformation figures and geeked out together as only a church full of theology nerds can. When other teens were watching Top Gun on repeat at sleepovers, my church friend and I were watching the, it turns out, wildly historically inaccurate, but wonderful movie, Lady Jane, about the fiercely devout Protestant queen who reigned for nine days before being imprisoned and executed by the Catholic Queen Mary. I revered her, and I'm sure I dressed up as her at least once or twice for our Reformation parties. It is extraordinary that something that happened 500 years ago is still so influential. A recent Google search showed me that Reformation Day parties that take the place of Halloween are still a staple of some churches. And the idea of grace, which Paul writes about in our reading today, so influenced my father that he spent his youth preaching on street corners and made grace my middle name while my mom was off being a hippie. He was out on the street corners. He now preaches in churches. It's much more respectable. I'm a walking, talking testament to how much Luther and other reformers transformed our world. It was October 31 in 1517 when Martin Luther famously posted his 95 theses on a church door. And it is this moment that we often point to as the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. He was specifically upset about the abuse of indulgences, a get-out-of-jail-for-a-certain-price sort of card to spring souls from purgatory and, not so coincidentally, to fund the building of St. Peter's Basilica. It's really a quite genius capital campaign strategy, if you think about it. After spending this time uh, this week on the church budget and wishing for a magic money fairy to materialize and balloon our income money, our income, I feel some sympathy for these corrupt clergy who jumped on the idea of using the old practices of indulgences <laughs> to swell those church coffers. But I promise, despite the fact that I am Episcopalian and not Lutheran, I will be a good Lutheran and we will not resort to selling any indulgences in the back after the service's fundraisers. I think there are only cupcakes back there, so you're safe. But back to the point. Luther's 95 Theses, which I took the time to read this week, brilliantly wrest the power of salvation out of the hands of greedy humans and back into the hands of God. God's grace, God's power, God's love, that is what saves us. And no one should get in between us and the God who rescues us from those things that damage, destroy, and cause us to turn inward on ourselves and self-interest and away from love of others. This intense commitment to salvation through faith alone and to the idea of God's grace, not human works, saving us, absolutely transformed the church. And the Reformation gave us so many wonderful gifts. The gift of Bibles in our own hands, liturgies in our own language, the belief that each person has access to God without having to go through a church hierarchy, the belief that what is corrupt in the church can and should be challenged. But reformers also burned people at the stake for disagreeing with their theology. Different Protestant factions attacked each other viciously and often fatally. Those who believed in infant baptism drowned Anabaptists who practiced adult baptism. Bloody wars erupted. The church was reformed, but it was also fractured and full of violence, and the bloody religious wars caused many to turn away from the church and religion entirely. I believe God's Spirit was so at work in the Reformation to transform what had become corrupt in the church. But I also believe that the human tendency to use religion as a weapon was very much at work during the Reformation period, and I believe it never stopped being at work in the church. Grace. It should be an idea that liberates and heals. Nothing can stand between us and the love of God because God is reaching out for us always. But here's what happens. 
Sometimes we decide that we are God, and we get to decide who is worthy and who is not. We twist religion and use the concept of sin to declare those who are different from us as dangerous and wrong. We discriminate against them and even outlaw the core of their God-given identities, even trying to legislate away someone's gender identity, expression, or sexual orientation. We still use religion to kill and to destroy. If not directly, then indirectly, as people in reparative therapy despair because they cannot change their sexual orientation despite trying everything. We kill when we keep people from accessing the kind of medical care they need in order to affirm their gender identity. We kill when we don't preach the love of God. I stayed in the church even after I went through my own period of despair after flunking out of one of the many ex-gay programs out there, coming out just as bisexual as I went in. I stayed in the church because I discovered grace in a new way. I'd always been taught that grace meant that God saved me even though I really, really, really didn't deserve it. And lots of things made me internalize that message, which has some truth to it, as a declaration that I was unlovable, undeserving, wrong, and corrupt through and through. What I discovered, though, through churches that loved and affirmed all of me, is a God who took me and my despairing self up in arms of unending love and taught me that I am made in God's image. I may be prone to sin, as we all are, but I am also delighted in by my Creator. I was made for love and from love, lovable through and through. And my bisexuality and my gender is not something to be ashamed of, but a part of my God-given identity, affirmed and loved and full of grace. I discovered that grace meant that God always reaches for me, never forgets me and delights in me and in saving me from those things that I turn to that do destroy me and others. But so many others have left the church behind because they have only experienced exclusion and rejection and a denial that they too are made in the image of God, and I don't blame them. We have some reforming to do, you all. And I believe we are going through another reformation now. What God is doing in the church is so much bigger than my human heart and human eyes can comprehend. But I know it has something to do with liberation and love. I know it has something to do with religion becoming more and more a force for peace and love and justice rather than a weapon. I know that it has something to do with proclaiming a God who made us each, calls us each by name, never condemns us for our nationality, our ethnicity, our race, our gender, gender identity, gender expression, our class, our sexual orientation. I know it is about building the beloved community that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke so eloquently of. And I know it has something to do with our gospel reading today. Religion is about loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, and soul, and loving our neighbors as ourselves. That is at the heart of the church, the love that reaches all. It is appropriate that our first quarterly Sunday meant to highlight our commitment as a reconciling in Christ church happens to fall on Reformation Sunday. In a bit, we'll be watching a video about how trans children and youth have been affected by recent discrimination, and we will be taking up an offering to benefit the Tre Trevor Project, which supports LGBTQ plus youth in crisis. So to end this sermon, I am going to read our updated RIC statement, which you will be asked to approve at the next congregational meeting. It is, I believe, a beautiful statement of our longing and intent to continue to reform the church so it is a space of liberation, hope, and healing for all people. Our statement reads, LCM is proud to be a reconciling in Christ congregation. As the living body of Christ, we invite all to God's table to worship, to participate, or simply rest at Lutheran Church of the Master. Whatever your religious background, whether it is strong, wavering, or non-existence, whatever your race or ethnicity, whatever your age, whatever your sexual orientation, 
gender identity, or gender expression, whatever your physical, emotional, or mental ability, whatever your economic circumstances, whatever your personal struggles, whatever your family configuration, we love you for every aspect of who you are. We joyfully strive for racial equity, protecting the environment, and social and economic justice, as well as breaking down walls, serving the community, and loving one another. We affirm those who have known the pain of exclusion or discrimination in church and society. God's grace includes you. Amen.